Alex Unchuk, I'm so happy to have you with us this morning for our webinar on honeybee animal husbandry, what and when you do or don't do matters. And Alex, I'll turn the screen over to you. Um, I'm going to get right to it. Uh, we usually don't have a lot of time uh, for Q&A at the end, and I really, really would like to hear uh, from some of the folks out there. I think that's part of the reason you tune in, if you have some particular little issue. But with that said, <clears throat> let me start off by saying that where I'm going to hit you here uh, before we get even to the overview is um, I was delighted to have this wedge right here in the middle of the summer um, because it, it turns into a bunch of things. And, and then I try to do that. Um, it's a little bit of a pep talk. Um, I need it. Uh, some of you need it. Uh, things are beginning to percolate. Um, it's a little bit of a cheat sheet. Um, and I hope when we get done, um, I'll even throw in a little specific kind of summer recipe um, that um, it, 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 as much as I am the theory guy, um, beekeeping boils down to practicality um, of getting things done in the bee yard. Um, so without further ado, let me, let me start moving things along. Um, for those of you who want to re reach out to me as well, there'll be a contact at the end or on your PDF. Uh, so again, I'm always happy to take a question. If I've said something in this webinar you'd like to uh, extend or disagree with, um, I'm happy to have that conversation. Um, one little piece of housekeeping that I just have to get off my plate, um, and I thought of this at the last minute, um, a good friend of mine, um, this is going to seem like a sh shameless plug, but anybody who knows me personally knows that I'm, I'm going to, I veer away from the bright, hot, white spotlight most of the time. But I was given this particular award uh, by the Double Bliss fa uh, family, uh, by the Eastern Apicultural Society. And I was unable to attend the award ceremony. Part of the uh, idea behind an award is to acknowledge the award uh, in public. Uh, so uh, I appreciate very much the fact that um, they uh, initiated this award. I think it's a great acknowledgement for people out there and something for other folks to even strive for. So with that said, let's just dive into it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the here and now. Um, I'm going to try to introduce a, what I call a paradigm or a perspective shift, um, the way I look at beekeeping, um, um, and, and has now become a bit of a thing. Anybody that, that uh, is around my work knows that uh, I'm the bee curves guy. Um, I like to look at things visually. Uh, it, a lot of information is contain, contained pictorially, and so we're going to jump into a lot of bee curves and try to understand them. Um, but we're also, uh, if we're going to talk about animal or insect husbandry here, um, we're going to go back a little bit and talk about good old-fashioned stimulus response or if-then things, how things work in the real world. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about external and internal forcing functions. That's more of a physics, math kind of language, but it'll make sense when I bring them up uh, and show you. Um, and finally, with all of this happening, um, we have a lot of the same old things that are bothering us, but we still continue to be in this heavy mortality or even spiral death cycle. And so we... With, without things happening uh, on the forefront, we are going to have to adjust and adapt to the tools that we have, and we can do better. Um, and as I said earlier, I hope to end on kind of a summer recipe and, and bring it home. So as a teaser, um, this is what happens if you do things right. If you, get, if you have the right year, you right, have the right external events, and then using something that we'll, uh, we'll get to called monitoring to get the internals right, um, you get the genetics, you get queen genetics, right? Uh, you do nutritional feeding, you do stimulation early in the year. Um, you can achieve results like this that are really twofold. Number one, um, we've, if you'll notice, we had um, uh, made all the hives equal in size. We were able to do that um, um, by doing brood augmentation um, and other things like that and, and, and so forth that you can create some of these super hives and this was an experiment that we did specifically working with a group um, who is primarily interested in honey production. And the key was, could you use <clears throat> some of these animal husbandry tips and tricks in order to push these colonies specifically for honey production? And, and since some of you are interested in that, um, this is just, again, this is a kind of a visual representation of what can happen. Obviously, these had to be healthy hives in order to produce this, but um, you can do much more. <clears throat> So I find it ironic that we're talking about, um, pardon me, uh, animal or insect husbandry at a time when 
m more of us are away from the farm than we ever used to be. A hundred years ago, if you would flip this around, 98% of us were on the farm, 2% of us were in the city, uh, but we, 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 we played with uh, gardens, we had direct contact. Today, that's almost uh, the inverse. Uh, about 2% of us are on the farm, 98% uh, of us have little or nothing to do with animals or gardens or so forth. But this fascination with bees has kind of drug an entire populace um, into yet an animal-centric world. Um, and there are still some old things in there um, that you just can't get away from. And as I said, once um, you, you take on this responsibility, um, there are things that in order to be successful at it, you're just going to have to do. Um, that involves training, timing, discipline, and so forth. But um, again, I find it ironic, interesting, and encouraging, by the way, uh, that uh, our eyes are being reopened uh, again to an old uh, agricultural world. There, was, there, was, there were a lot of great lessons uh, that came out of that that I think can be applied to today. So um, <clears throat> a little bit of an alert here. In, in, insect husbandry is what I refer to as monitoring. It's just another name for it. Uh, it it's a synonym. Um, for those who want to go back into other webinars, we have monitoring specifically that's acknowledged at large. So I'm not going to go through all of that again, and I'm going to concentrate more on a little, a little less, and I, so, I know some of you will be disappointed but a little less on the what's and the why's and concentrate on a little more of the wins because I think that's one of the things that we're really getting wrong. Um, it's when we have to do things. We're already educating ourselves. There are a lot of tools out there, but a lot of the time it's when we're doing things or not doing things that are really beginning to affect us. So um, let's make it real. Uh, this is a real story uh, from a uh, colleague down the road, gifted so many hives, um, didn't really know what he was getting into, um, didn't really want to dive in uh, head full, uh, didn't know a lot about beekeeping. Um, so as I said, he was kind of a passive observer, a bystander, right? A set it and forget it kind of guy. You put, you put them down, bees know what to do. They've been at it for 200 million years. Just give them room, let them do their thing. As you walk through this list, you'll see that, and I'm sure many of you can commiserate with this, that's not the case today. Um, set it and forget it, beekeeping is gone. Um, this now, you really have to be a conscious observer and you have to be an arbiter in your colonies. You have to get in there, you have to do things, and you have to do them at a certain time. There's, there's just no way around it. Um, let's, let, let me bring this to a, a more specific. I went through this whole thing again this spring. Um, in, I'm in the southwestern uh, corner of Ohio, um, Oxford, Ohio, Miami University, the, the birthplace of the modern beehive where L.L. Uh, L. Langstroth uh, did his seminal work here in the 1850s um, and gave us the modern beehive. But here we were this spring, and I went down to the various yards as the bees came up from the south and people were picking up their packages. And this is, this is very familiar to many of you. You pick up your bees, those that are available to you. They are often arriving too late in the season, but you don't know that. Um, you think you've got an entire summer to build up. You do and you don't. Um, and then you do inspections, but do you know what you're looking for? Um, and do you do them on time? I mean, you, you want your bees to settle in, so you give them a week or two or three. And again, if everything took off as hoped, that can work for you. But many times, right out of the gate, um, depending on the yards that I were in and the bees that came up from the south, um, anywhere from, you know, nearly nothing to 20, 30, and 40 percent had problems from the get-go, but these problems weren't identified until much later in the game. So, again, a little too little too late. Um, we reach the end of the year, and all of a sudden, if it's not a dead out, it's been an unproductive colony. It just isn't moving the way it should. Um, is this what beekeeping is really all about? Some of you are wondering. So it, ter it turns out that one of the interesting and odd things about beekeeping is that the 95% of it is very much a routine. Um, and you would expect that. Almost anything we do year over year, it's, it is kind of a wash, rinse, repeat. Um, but things have changed over time. And that is, I've got the pre post Langstroth hive, uh, you know, before we were able to keep bees in a box, then after. And, and, and then things kind of settled down again, and we became kind of box mechanics, and we became um, just management experts. 
And then we hit the Varroa years um, about 27 years ago. And so we have a pre post Varroa uh, life. And everything changed after that happened. So many of you who've come to the table relatively recently, um, this is the world you live in. You don't know the golden years, the years before. <clears throat> I hesitate to say how many decades I've been involved in this, but I was definitely there before many of these problems took over. And so now the continuing problem that I alluded to before is things aren't getting much better. We have the same old tools. Uh, we have the new Varroa Destructor. We've had it now for almost three decades. But if you look at mortality numbers, things just keep getting worse. So what we really need is we need to do better with the tools we have. It would be nice to have a silver bullet, some quantum leap, some something. And there are things coming off the shelf that I think are going to surprise and delight us in the years to come. But for now, um, and to get us through the seasons, we just have to do better with what we've got. And one of them is, I think, a tool is us, the beekeeper. Um, we have to have a perspective shift or change. So let's go back to kind of fundamentals. Working with our bees, um, I classify them or put them in a stimulus response organism. It's a complex yet simple organism. They have about a million neurons uh, to work with, and it is astounding the uh, complexity of behavior that can come out of those million neurons, but it's also amazing how relatively simple that behavior is, as this picture of classic that most of us know, you feed a dog, you blow a whistle, you blow the whistle, um, and you can get the dog to salivate without the food being there. Well, bees, bees work very much like this. A good example would be the bee space that Langstroth uh, introduced us to, the 3 8 inch bee space. At any time of the year, and I encourage somebody to try this fun little experiment on December 25th as a Christmas present, if the weather is working for you, wherever you are, you can go into your colony and you can pull out a brood frame, watch the weather, and you can come back within 20 minutes. And you're going to find these bees chaining and hanging to try to make wax, to fill in that space. What are bees doing in the middle of winter making wax? Do they have the resources? Do they have the, the right age wax builders? The point is they can't help themselves. It's a stimulus response reaction. One of the fun things we do in the summertime around here is bee racing, believe it or not, where to demonstrate von, von Frisch's um, uh, bee's ability to locate and communicate nectar sources back to the colony, we'll take and mark a bunch of uh, foragers coming in with different colors, uh, send students out uh, uh, to the uh, compass rows uh, a couple of hundred yards, blow a whistle, and then uh, have the bees see who races back and who gets back to the to the hive entrance the first. Now, it's a fun uh, thing for students uh, to watch. On the other hand, it really demonstrates a fundamental stimulus response mechanism in bees. So one last one on this one, and, and I really have to give Mel credit. I, I think a lot more work is being done these days uh, for uh, making your own queens. Uh, this is OTS, the on-the-spot queen rearing. Uh, method uh, that Mel has been uh, uh, kind of pushing uh, very successfully. And, and I really encourage many of you to take a second look at this. Um, come back to the slide. Um, it's, it's, it's a good read. Um, uh, there's some videos out there. Um, but if you want to do simple, uh, small scale queen rearing, this is a great way to do it. And one of the ways that it works is that Mel and others had figured out that you've got to have a vertical space in order for bees uh, to produce a queen cell that's larger than the typical cell size. And so if you give them that space, but first we observe that, why do they build cells on the bottom of the, the frame bars? Because they have that, that vertical space to do so. You can recreate that yourself with your hive tool. Um, and you can basically cause them, stimulate them to raise queens at your will. So again, a simple stimulus response. Oh, and there was one last one. Um, Another uh, good example of this working was West Virginia last year. Um, they had some starvation problems the year before, so they spent a lot of time, energy, and money supplying everyone in the state who asked um, for some type of sugar supplement. Um, so whether it was a fondant or sugars or some of the patties, um, everybody got uh, everybody who asked had gotten a, a sugar a supplement for the spring. Interesting problem. Um, you probably some of you know what happened with that. Be careful what you wish for. 
um, they produce these monster hives um, and early. And so West Virginia went from a starving problem the year before to a swarming, early swarming monster problem in mid-spring um, in 2017. Again, classic stimulus response. And I'm going somewhere with this. Um, with these various examples, many of us find ourselves in a position of looking at our bees and they do their thing and we do our thing and the two shall not meet. What I'm trying to encourage here is that you take a step across that divide and understand that, not that you're a taskmaster, but once you understand how you can stimulate and get a response out of your bees, your beekeeping life changes completely. A good example would be, some of you are familiar with this old poster that's still cycling around, and if you look at it, it's the classic beekeeper's year. And you'll find very little, there was nothing in here at the time that this was presented about throwing on miticides and looking for small hive beetle and how do you control wax moths and how do you do, that wasn't in here. That wasn't their problem when this poster was designed. Um, and this was your classic year on this month, on that day, you did these things. And it was a pretty interesting and simple time. Um, those are not our times. So I'm gonna introduce now how we basically can become kind of the masters of our colonies by observing other stimulus responses that either are being forced upon our bees or that we can control. And in particular, I'm going to talk about external uh, forcing functions or inter and internal forcing functions. So a, a, a good example, and I always like to use graphs to simplify things because there's a lot of data buried in here. And even when I look at something like this, my eyes tend to roll in the back of my head and it takes me two or three minutes to settle down. And what, what, are we, what am I really looking at here? And this is an example of temperature and rainfall in the local Cincinnati area, which we're only about 45 uh, miles from here. But let's, let's break it down and let's simplify it and look at it like this. This is essentially the same curve as before, but just simplified. So this is one of the external uh, functions that we talked about. We've got rain, we've got temperature and light, and they tend to work this way. If you look at the calendar from January to December, um, many people don't realize that in most parts of the United States, certainly in Ohio, um, right smack in the middle of the year are uh, May, June, July, into August. These are our wettest months, even though it doesn't feel like it. It's been hot here, it's been dry here. But if you look at the overall rainfall, we get the most rain in the middle of the year, um, light uh, and temperature working the same together or correlated. And so this is a actually pretty good representation, but simplified of something that's affecting your bees. So the first thing that the temperature, rainfall, and light affects is our flora. What is growing around us are directly correlated to the amount of light we have in the year, the temperature that we have, and the rainfall. It just works that way. A good way to read this is if you look, in, in particular, your areas are going to shift a little bit, but we get this big nectar flow um, come late spring, early summer, derived from the spring rains and the heat that's coming on. And then as we reach July, August into September, the heat is on. And so, men, though it's green out there, the great green expanse is, is a trick. Too many beekeepers are going, why am I got my bees late, but why am I not getting honey? Everything is green and lush and growing. And the fact of the matter is, it's so hot out there. Um, most of the things that we're going to flower, flower already. We have some perennials that are still going. But by comparison to the large S, it's very much smaller. Then the fall rains come, and we still have some temperature working for us. And we get this spike um, around here. It's goldenrod and aster in your area. It'll be something else. And um, again, this is a forcing function. The, literally, the weather forces our flora uh, to behave this way. So if you, if you literally look at this, it's not hard to see that just looking at the flora curves, there really are two bee seasons in most areas across the United States. Um, you have the first bigger uh, summer season, and then you have the bigger, uh, the smaller fall season. Um, and, and, and I bring that up because we'll talk about that later. There are things that you can do with those. I'm going to simplify another curve like I did with the weather. This has to do with high population. It turns out that there are different castes and ages and groups within the colony. And if you broke it down, this is absolutely fascinating. Um, you should spend some time looking at this. This is what's really going on, the nuts and bolts uh, inside your colony. But it, it can also be a little overwhelming. And I recommend we just go to here. 
this is what your bee populations generally look like um, around uh, the, in, for the whole season. As things change, your bee populations build up. Many of you have kind of an intuitive feel for this. Then we reach that kind of summer high, uh, and then we fall as the temperatures are there, the floor is not there, fall back down, and then our bee populations again respond to the environment, and they pick up again a little bit in the fall. One of the things we have to also keep in mind as we're doing this is that this is not static. We are moving through the season here, and it's very important because can't you all just remember the other day that it was spring, you were just getting your bees, you were happy for the overwinter, you got your swarms, and here we are now, literally post honey crop season. It's gone, it's over. We have a very short season. We're not typical farmers. We don't look at the whole year. Uh, we'll manage through the whole year, but if you're a honey producer, um, and, and that's something that you're specifically striving for, you have to accept the fact that your bees are only going to really get going in March and April, and it's all over by the time we hit July. Um, one of the things I also want to keep in mind is variability, uh, yearly variability. Um, all, all things don't happen on March 24th or May 15th or July 16th. Our years literally get skewed by the weather. Um, so many of you are familiar, if you just think back one, two, three, five years that are still probably in memory, we can literally be shifted by as much as two plus weeks. So when many people come calling and asking, what do I win, what do I do, and exactly when do I do it, it all depends on that year. Uh, we can't give you a specific date and your bees. But let's put this all together. Everything that I just said, one of the things that we can put together is we went from a simple stimulus response organism that I was mentioning, and we want to throw our bees in the mix of this. So our bees are literally being impinged by the weather above, temperature, light, rain, and the nectar from below. They are literally both, we, we're being forced from the weather, we are being forced from the floor, and our bees, as I showed earlier, are responding in kind. So for some of you who are wondering, why, why, why the populations, how do they move over time, and, and why do they move the way they do over time? Well, like the stimulus response organism that it is, it's because it's reacting to both, its, in this particular case, its external environment. <clears throat> so, um, well, I just said that. <clears throat> Pardon my throat here. This was the slide I was looking for. Sorry for the, 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 uh, the stutter here. As I said, I've been sick the last few days. So I think this clearly kind of gives people, again, uh, a, a, a sense of our bees are literally, as many of you have learned, that the queen is not the ruler of the colony. She is actually ruled by the other bees. How they feed her, don't feed her, what they feed her, literally determines whether or not she'll lay, how much she'll lay. The same thing for the hive at large. This population is literally defined by the environment it lives in. So depending on where you are, what state you're in, um, your weather conditions, your curves are going to look a little different, a little higher, lower, a little left, a little right. But again, your bees are going to be reacting to your environment. So your curves are going to take a slightly different shape, but it'll be the same principle. So in a simple world, again, this was pre-Varroa, we could have looked back at that old yearly calendar, and if you said, what do I do in the season? This was pretty much it. You started off by taking off mouse guards in the spring after the frost. Um, you take their winter wraps off. You swap brood chambers a little later on as your bees are building up to reduce uh, the swarming, give your bees uh, more potential. You put supers on early before you need them and plenty of time to reduce congestion and swarming. And then finally, you let them do their thing and then we come down to kind of the symmetry of the, at the post year. You build up, then you break down. And that's very typically the way things happened. And interestingly enough, this is very much the mindset of many beekeepers yet today. Um, not that it's malicious, it's just that they either don't have the knowledge yet to understand the full ramifications of, of the Varroa problem with its pathogen uh, issues, and or they just don't have the mechanical knowledge to realize yet where we are in the grand scheme of things. So in this story, um, we've got to have a villain. Um, and in our villain, uh, most of you um, 
can appreciate that primarily, again, it's Varroa, Varroa, Varroa. But more importantly than Varroa um, is actually its infected Varroa or direct Varroa hosting pathogens, bacterial and viral, um, that express themselves in your colony. So we're, this, this has changed everything about beekeeping, and we have to respect that some of these things are under your control and some of them are not. So um, a, a slide that I had actually borrowed from Reed Johnson um, at the Wooster Bee Lab here uh, does a nice little example, kind of giving us a quantitative size and comparison of the typical kinds of things. Um, and this is dated a little bit, um, that are currently affecting our bees that was not on the seasonal calendar decades, just decades ago. A whole host of issues, um, and I'm not going to go through them that much. The problem that we have is that all of this stuff is moving. That um, if this wasn't a, a, a PDF but my PowerPoint, th this would all be shifting and changing and, and, and working with. And this is what makes it very difficult for beekeepers is that as you try to tamp down something, something else expresses itself, or something else is in play, or something else, uh, many, uh, many things are in play. And so to, to singularly identify a thing and be able to control it without affecting other things really, really becomes difficult. I've updated this graph a little bit to include a few other things that have risen most recently. And though they were hinted at, <clears throat> I think now they're playing a much more major role than they used to. And that is, aside from the, these internal forcing uh, functions, we have queen issues galore. Um, that's failing queens for a, a host of reasons. Uh, questionable genetics, um, uh, kind of queen mill farms out there, um, miticide, miticide, underuse, overuse, um, uh, genetic issues um, that, that are still being worked out. And, and I think for the general public have not been worked out successfully to give us a quality product, certainly for the quality price you're paying for them. And then last but not least, and I put this one really big right front and center, and I take a deep breath when I do this because you um, usually want to run, duck, and hide when you say this, but it's it beekeepers. Um, I'm not going to be as inglorious as some. Um, there's a, a, a euphemism out there referred to as piss poor beekeeping. Um, I'm not happy. Uh, that's just calling names, and, and it doesn't get us anywhere. Um, but I appreciate the sentiment from the production beekeepers and the professional beekeepers uh, that are hinting at that. And so what we're going to do here is there's a lot of reasons why it's difficult for us in general uh, to get there. There's a lot of things that are keeping us uh, from being the beekeepers that we wished we were or that we could be. And some of these, I'm, I'm not going to uh, boil them down. There just simply isn't time. Um, in, in a 50-plus in a minute slot to go through all of these. But some of them just absolutely con confound us. And so uh, we have all kinds of regiments in the rest of our lives. Um, notice some of the other problems that affect um, society, whether it's Weight Watchers or alcoholism or drug abuse or whatnot. And I bring these up only to show that when you have an insidious problem, the steps and the lengths that we must go to in order to change human behavior, in order to conquer these things. Well, beekeeping can be something like this. Um, I digress as an aside a little bit. Um, let me get back to one of the reasons that, um, of things that are actually happening in your colony, a byproduct of, of the, um, the melees of things that are affecting your hive, usually means to this kind of this spiral of death, um, and ultimately why your bees fail or why they don't. And come back at your leisure and look at that. But again, simplified, this is what happens. Instead of getting those nice big populations that make, make you honey or help your, your colony sustain health, heat, and a whole bunch of other things, um, the, the, the populations literally crash. Um, and whether we call it CCD, whether we call it uh, something else, the fact of the matter is your high populations are being impinged. Uh, by all these other things. So I'm, I'm going to hit this last little sad note <clears throat> and then move on to uh, I hope things that are going to inspire. And that is, this is something that I just feel it necessary that in, at midsummer here, when you still have an opportunity to change things, this is why you should change. The mortality numbers out there are even higher than this. this is the latest was in 2016. 2017 numbers were bad. Early 2018 numbers were worse. 
and we've been hitting this way. Um, I'm going to put this um, kind of, I, I, I don't believe it when I say it. I started beekeeping in northern Wisconsin when I was 10 years old. And at that time, my records show that from the cold winters, this was northern Wisconsin, I had an annual 3% mortality, 3%. Let's fast forward to today, where the average mortality in states like Wisconsin now are above 60%. Same with Ohio and the surrounding states, 60%. So I think many of you will appreciate that that's not sustainable, and it's something that we have to do something about. The other critique that I have for the data that's being shown is that that only shows us hive loss. And I'm a really big um, fanatic about um, overall health, hive health and hive conditions, not just hive loss. Uh, black and white, uh, live or die, uh, those are in, you know, interesting uh, metrics, but I really want to know how many colonies are healthy. How many colonies are productive? Did you get from your colony what you hoped this year? Did you get uh, the honey crop? Did you get enough bees to do the pollination? Um, were, were they productive? And again, um, I'm making an argument that the numbers are even more dire uh, than they seem because they're underreported. So at the end of the day, we're left with uh, being somewhat confused, somewhat frustrated, uh, angry um, about what's happening. For those of you who are who've managed to trench through your first year, into your second year, into your third year, um, many of you have already discovered that either you're on a learning curve um, or you're not. And so we ha you've had to put away the ideas that you're just going to get these bees, and if you say the right things and you, you uh, do the, well, in this case, not doing the right things, um, that the bees will take care of themselves. Or you play even the self-blame game. I, I must have done something or not. And the, the fact of the matter is, it's a little bit of all of that. So one last perspective key on all of that data that I just showed you, and it's so hard to simplify anymore all of those numbers and all of those viruses and bacteria and chemicals and genetics and everything else, is to take all of that, put it on a shelf for a moment and say, where am I going to concentrate my energy? And so one of the things you have to not worry about is not that they shouldn't be on your radar. But if you look and see what is killing or affecting most colonies, so if it's hot, small hive beetle, three to seven percent of colonies are infected by small hive beetle. Could be more in your area, could be less. But again, the, the numbers are relatively simple. Um, American or European fall brood that we all have heard about or we worry about. Um, but interestingly enough, right now, it used to be worse, um, is only affecting about one to two percent of our colonies. So when you look at some of the other things that you may not or, or may be looking at, chalk brood, sack brood, fowl brood, other things that are out there, even nosema, um, it turns out that if you put these in perspective, um, where are you going to spend your time and energy on things that may or may not occur on a 1 to 3 to 5% chance? Or as I indicate here, let me assure you, you all have Varroa. If you don't, write me. Um, send me pictures. Um, I want to see it. Um, and so with everybody having Varroa, this is where we have to spend, spend our time. And the bigger issue that we have to is understanding that Varroa is there, but now Varroa has morphed from being Varroa to Varroa destructor. It is the bacteria and the viruses that they carry that are the prime enemies because we have no cures. There is no miticide. That are gonna, that's going to cure the bacterial agents. So some 15, 17, 19 primary viruses, as an example, have been identified. What are you going to do about it? There is no medicine. There is no silver bullet. There is no magic pill. There's nothing from some warehouse or pharmaceutical shop that you can get. However, what you can do is by suppressing Varroa, the carrier, you end up suppressing the spread of the pathogens. And that really, again, is a part of our big job. So again, now on the little lighter side of the news, there is good news out there. You know, one of the things that you did is we looked around and we looked at, at uh, the, um, the uh, professional beekeepers. They've got skin in the game. They have a lot of money in the game. And when you look at their numbers, they don't have 30, 40, 50, 60 percent mortality. They don't. Um, they usually have them in single or low double digits. And think about that spread. That's amazing. What are they doing? What are you doing that's different in order to achieve that 
uh, th those those same numbers. So this is where we're you're forced to step into this realm. You you don't have to become a professional beekeeper, but you have to do some of the things that the professional beekeepers are doing um, in order to reduce your overall mortality. And let us be clear here: one of the mistakes that people make when they even start introducing miticides. Um, either they do it so pro prophylactically, it's that time of month, that day of the month, that hour of the day, it's time to put the miticides on. And we've gotten away from that. Um, that's prophylactic treatments um, because all miticides have effects. Um, we, we can have, we, we will build up resistance in our varroa mites. Um, we will uh, find chemicals that are uh, ineffective after a certain time. So whether then you then evolve to an integrated pest management system with revolving treatments and so forth, all of that still comes under play. The mindset here is that you're not going to kill all of these pests and diseases. You're not. So what really enters into it, a changing mind perspective, is you, you have to manage your pests and diseases. You're not going to eradicate them. Um, if that's just not going to happen. So when you call into managing, managing then brings up one of my favorite uh, uh, general um, B nomenclature, monitoring. And monitoring, again, I'm going to define it here simply is knowing what issues to look for and when, taking timely actions, whether it's treatments or manipulations, um, and then finally verifying that the very actions that you took are working. And a lot of us forget that third step. But somewhere along the first and second step, that's kind of a beekeeper maturing phase that you have to literally kind of step on the learning curve. And you have to, I mean, what is it that I'm supposed to be looking for? And what does it look like? And when should I look? And then finally, that next big break is taking uh, particular steps. So with that being said, back, back to curves, how do I put all of that into practice? Well, one of them, and I'm just going to use this as an example, is when we look at the growth of, of typical pests and diseases in the colony, they come on a little later after, out of phase of the, the population cycles. To that, the, the point here, and this isn't a, a webinar on, on treating varroa, but what's a, a good takeaway here is that monitoring has gotten to the point now where instead of just using kind of fly-by-the-night sticky boards and guesses and by goshes and gullies, we literally know that we can do sugar shakes, we can use known samples of bees, we get known uh, mite counts, and with that now, we can reach thresholds where we're finally given accurate numbers that literally say treat, don't treat. And I think that's one of the great takeaways uh, that, that has come out of the modern era. So we go from simple mechanics that we used to in the beekeeping gear to maybe something a little more complicated. Um, it looks complicated from here, um, but this is beekeeping today. So we do the same old things that we did before, but now we look at these forcing functions uh, inside the colony and we have to address them. And a good way to do that, and again, please look at this offline, um, is we, we talk about early stimulation and feeding. We talk about feeding for nutrition. We talk about um, uh, feeding uh, for uh, starvation. Uh, we include all of that as well as going in and just monitoring, taking a baseline early in the year, um, and then sporadically. And to be honest with you, one takeaway from this particular curve is this is kind of a um, worst case scenario of how often you actually have to get in. Um, but on the other hand, if your bees are doing fine, monitoring will tell you that, and you can take a step back from that. So I keep talking about hive monitoring, um, and it's, it, just, it just has to be the uh, weapon of choice in your arsenal today. Um, what you use for a particular miticide can come into play. The bigger issue here is, you know, I, I've started working with, I think it's three years ago now, uh, uh, the um, APRI diagnostic kit with the Ohio State Beekeepers uh, Association. Um, and, I'm, and I'm currently working on uh, this manual for hive monitoring. But it really, many of you are doing it, you're, you're not calling it that, and some of you aren't doing it, and you have to get there. And I, I'm going to run through a couple of things just, just that, you, that some of you aren't thinking about monitoring. Most of you are thinking about food stock and food sources, but there are a lot of other things in here that you can. But these are part, 
particularly the things when you go into a colony. Um, I always make an argument. Take, take 30 seconds and say, why am I here? What am I looking for this time of year? And what should I expect? And so there are various things that are going to change throughout the year. And once you train your brain to look for these particular things, you have a plan. Uh, you know, pull out your B-curve sheet. Um, you know, write notes down. This, this is what should be happening at this time. This is what should not be happening at this time. That's going to give you a, a perspective. I was encouraged to put this one in uh, by a friend because he's very frustrated as a bee inspector that one of the problems, again, this gets us back to beekeeping, beekeepers, and that's us, is that we have to step up our game. I mean, the bees are struggling out there. And uh, back under the animal husband. Um, the argument is, as we would not allow our dogs and cats to languish, um, not feed them proper diets, not exercise them, not give them the uh, shots and or uh, even, in this case, tick or miticides that they need seasonally, um, we would be remiss uh, and be, I, I guess the expression today is poor pet parents. Well, the same thing has to happen with honeybees. Are we going to be good or bad um, insect parents? And again, it takes work. Um, one of the other uh, things that kind of baffles people is about the timing. And when you saw the curve that I showed earlier, I'm sure some of you were gasping about, wow, I didn't buy into this. Um, you know, I, I've only got you know, so many hours in a day, a week, a month. Uh, and I want to make the argument, um, you know, we call them fire drills or, or whatnot. But the fact of the matter is, you can do a hive inspection looking for specific things um, in two to three minutes. It really is true. You can pop the top off, the inner cover off, whether you have to wade through the supers to get to the center brood chamber, which is basically the oracle. It's going to tell you everything you need to know about that colony's health. Um, once you get into the, the method, it's like doing sugar shakes. Difficult the first one, two, three, four times you do them. But after you get used to this mindset, so it's not just a general trip through the treating the grocery store if it were a museum and you're just pushing your cart along looking at everything. Um, this is specifically going in looking for a specific thing at a specific time of the year. And we're caught by this, by the way. I like this picture from this year. Uh, people were telling me when I was pushing that we're late. We're late. Um, and they were going, ah, it can't be. It's, it's, this is Ohio. It's only February. Well, this was on February 28th. And I went into a bunch of boxes when the temperatures just crested 55, I think, that day. And look at the brood that we were seeing in February. So already our bees were way ahead of you. I would also ask you to look, by the way, on these particular frames. Do you see any honey stored in the corners of these? Do you see any obvious signs of pollen that are there? So these young bees that are going to be raised here are already going to be in distress. Um, certainly they're moving along. If we had planned on doing things like feeding for nutrition or stimulation, we are already the end of February. We're behind the game. So you're, you, the weather, again, can, can, can fool you. Uh, you get a, a week of really nice weather. Your bees will respond in kind. And they will literally start creating bees because they don't know what the next week, the next month looks like. They don't think that way. And so you can find yourself already behind the curveball, depending on what you're going to do. This was another colony on that same uh, uh, February 28th. And some of you can already see, look at the drone brood that was on here. This isn't just a drone layer, because obviously there's regular worker brood in here. But this colony already at the end of February was priming itself to say, hey, I've liked this spate of warm weather. We might be one of those early swarming colonies. And so if you read the literature, it's going to say end of February, a drone brood. Oh, you're kidding. Well, not so. So again, you, you have to play it um, as it stands. One of the other uh, classic shots that I want to throw in for monitoring is that, again, not all hives are created equal, not all queens are created equal. Um, these pictures were taken last fall uh, from two colonies that were beside in, in the apiary that we have out here at uh, Miami University Bee Lab, um, right, right beside each other. And you can clearly see that they're not the same. Um, one has an almost stellar, this was in September of the year. Look at the brood that we had as we were building our winter bees. Uh, to take us through the winter on one colony and not on the other. And to be honest with you, there are reasons I won't get into here. The uh, colony on the left should have been 
seen to, monitored, treated, augmented uh, earlier than this because you get a certain point in the season where it, what you do is not going to make much difference. But let me get back to um, one of the reasons we find this hard. We, we human beings find this hard. And I think sometimes, like the early brood growth in the colonies, we are surprised by time. And we're surprised by time because we tend to think linearly. It's just one plotting day, week, month after the other. We think of it as a line of time. When in effect, many of the things that are occurring in our seasonal cycles are not. They're geometric in time. And by that, I mean, let's take a look at what happens when we, typical soy, soy sorry for those of not in the soybean world, uh, but for those of you in anywhere in the Midwest here in the soybean world, from the road, you look at these soybeans and you're thinking, wow, they're coming along just great. My hive looks fine. You take a closer look and you're going, oh, well, I, I guess I seem to have some problems here. If you take that inspection, if you take that closer look, if you take a really close look just two weeks later from when that previous shot was taken, you find out that many things um, literally are on a geometric or hyperbolic curve and it's not linear. It, it just comes on so quickly. And one of the things that I want to throw that in as a primary example is many of you who get your packages or your nukes primarily from the warm breeding grounds in the South. One of the things that we have to put in, you're still thinking your bees are put in a box and they're kind of going to grow linear because it's spring. It's cool-ish. But the fact of the matter is, by the time you get these bees, those bees are a month and a half ahead of you uh, by weather down there. That means they're pests and their pathogens are already midsummer down there. And so by the time you put them on, uh, in on midsummer and you're thinking, well, I'm not going to have to worry until my midsummer to take a look at these things, you're already in their late summer, in their, hy their hypergeometric growth. And that's how things get away from us so early up here. We're not all. So what does this all translate into? Um, basically, what I'm asking is that um, there's no lack of beekeeper passion out there. There is not. But we literally have to take that passion and go from making it a passive thing to an active thing, a more disciplined thing. We just simply have to. So I'm, I've got a couple of slides in here that push this. I'm going to encourage you on the off, but I don't want to uh, labor on, on the individuals. Safe to say this is the problem when everybody asks, when do I monitor? The answer is, well, as needed. So the problem, the best line I can give you is get in early and then depending on what your bees are telling you, monitor as needed. If things are looking great, you've got low mite levels, um, then you can spread the distance between your points of inspection and monitoring. If things are not looking so good or they're questionable, you're going to have to speed that process up a little bit. There are times of the year when it becomes more critical than others. And in particular, so many things are happening now in the summer. Um, we've almost exhausted or have exhausted our pollen supplies that brought on those big populations, but there's nothing out there. It's dry. It's hot. Um, our, that, that flora curve that I showed you is, is waning. It's, it's, it's at a bare minimum. Uh, and, and depending on where you got your bees from, you have uh, an influx of, of, of pests and diseases. So, so let's take a, and, and try to make this somewhat practical, and that is, here's a, a classic monitoring approach. I, I've got a good location, there's good forage, I've got reasonably good bees, whatever that means, good queen, they seem healthy, um, and it's a good year. Uh, that rain temperature cycle, it just hit us right, and everything seems to be low pests and diseases, great. We'd all love to have this year, and some of us do get them. But the real thing that happens is that we go in with an iffy location. I mean, uh, there just isn't much forage there. At the end of the day, you have to look at that as well. Uh, when you look around, can I put my bees in a better place or am I going to be constantly feeding them or not feeding them and suffer the consequences? Um, I've got suspect bees, but the fact of the matter is, okay, fine, but fix them. Don't just let them languish. Bees don't get better by themselves, generally speaking. And, it, and, and I don't mean anything by this, but beekeeping by faith is not a good plan. You should take specific and directed action to try to in, in, make the bees that you want to have. And again, 
you can do all of these things right and still get an iffy season. It just it was cold, it was hot, it was dry, it was wet, and that that happens you know one, two, three seasons out of five, no matter where you are. And so we have a whole host of things that are starting to impact us. Probably what we see more often to get us to that 60% mortality is a combination of all of those things. I have an iffy location and I don't do anything about it. I don't feed. I've got bad bees to start, but I didn't recognize it. My queen died. I didn't requeen. I didn't augment with workers. I didn't, and it just went into this slow spiral of death. Bees only lived for six weeks in the summertime. On day one, they were starting to die, and the queen just never replaced them um, or never took off. And finally, I've got uh, a, an upload of pests and pathogens that I'm not seeing, I'm not recognizing. Maybe I even treated, but my bees are not responding to my treatments, and therefore I didn't go back in and check. I just said, hey, they're checked. I can go on vacation now. I'll check my bees in another three or four weeks, and I'll see how things are going. Um, again, a recipe for a disaster. So <clears throat> I'm looking at the clock here, and I want to see if I can give a little bit of time for some questions out there. So I'm going to just hit a couple of these slides from a top point of view. I think it's time, to be honest with you, that we stop being completely um, half full beekeepers. I think when you get into your colony, one of the things that you should do is you should assume that things are not right until you, the beekeeper, proves that they are. It, it's a twist. It's, it, it, it sounds like a game. But I think too many of us go in just expecting the best, and then we see the best, and we don't see the worst. And I think if you turn that on its head, you'll find out that um, you, you can, you, you, you'll, your beekeeping habits will change. Make them prove that things are going fine, um, and, uh, and you'll get there. Um, I said this earlier that um, not all bees are created equal. Not all beekeepers and not all seasons are created equal. That makes it difficult for, for beekeepers uh, to get in. I've, I've, I've hinted at that uh, go in early and then monitor as needed. Um, a, a soft note on the miticide thing is go soft with soft uh, chemicals, usually the acids, and then go hard. But again, that's more information than we have time for here. Uh, the bottom line is probably the most salient one here, and that is if you control varroa, you're controlling diseases, and diseases are your primary property. Now, even though you can't cure diseases, you can control them. So a quick little recap of some of the things. Feeding, uh, specific things that we can do for the summer now as we get in here. Feeding is important. There's no more nectar out there. There's no more pollen out there in most places. They need all of these. They need not only the carbohydrates, but they need the proteins, the vitamins, the minerals, the fats. Um, monitor your food source. When is the last time one of you went into your hives? And I mean within the last, say, three weeks and you could show me frames and frames of pollen that are still stored. Remembering how much it takes, and, and for some of your eyes, this comes as a little bit of a surprise, but the numbers are just telling. If you want to keep a simple colony through the year just to take care of itself, you're going to need about 2 million flowers. If you want 100 pounds of honey uh, for yourself, do the math. Um, you're not finding that in the local area. Um, it's just not happening. So again, I, I, this whole thing was supposed to be built and predicated on, I wanted to spend more time talking about seasonal timing and better times to do things. And again, take a look at this on your off time, but there are times when there's a demand for monitoring and a demand for the actions that you specifically can take as a beekeeper. Um, I said I, I was hitting a couple like feed. I want to hit queens. A lot of them are good, bad from the good go. Take a look at this, please. There are things you can't do. The clock is always ticking on queens. Always assume the worst. I'm sorry, but I'm going to go there. Assume the worst until your queen proves. Side to side, top to bottom, viability, then you're ready to go. Um, another thing that I want to throw in for the summer recipe is that there are things that you can do, but putting other frames of bees into weaker colonies. Again, look at this. Um, bees are going to be limited by the number of bee resources they have in a colony. Simply moving a frame or two of bees over from strong colonies can make all the difference in the world. And so this is a little bit of a, uh, of a uh, review. Uh, please take a look at that. Um, so here is where we were. Um, haphazard beekeeping, as I indicate here, usually gives haphazard results. Um, directed beekeeping gives directed results. Make the bees you want. If your bees aren't good to start with, make them better. Um, bees are complex, but they're actually still relatively simple. 
uh, organisms that you can do things. They're impinged by external and, in, and internal forces. Um, and we can go through the rest of these. Um, healthy hive monitoring is what you're shooting for. Everything else works from there. So um, here's a, a summer cheat sheet that I promised with the major nectar flows over. Remember that. Think next year. Work on your bees earlier. Remember February from that slide that I showed you earlier. You have to get in your bees earlier and work them earlier if you want to build those colonies up in time to match your nectar flows. Um, time, the good news right now in July, time is still on your side. So you have one, two plus months to build your bees up for the fall. Do so. Uh, monitor your colonies if you haven't been now. And again, go through this little recipe um, because it'll give you, uh, uh, you know, a cheat sheet on things that can still be now. If, we're, if we had this conversation in the middle of August, certainly by the end of August, the beginning of September, many of these things, there isn't time to make an effective difference in your colonies unless you really go through a massive uh, triage. And, and, and let's not do that. Let's, let's eat this elephant one bite at a time. So, so um, our hour is up. Questions, anybody? Great, thanks, Alex. I've turned the chat pod back on, folks. I'm sure you have a few questions for Alex. And Alex, I want to thank you for your um, your time and, and effort this morning and your experience that you put into um, creating a great webinar every year. A couple of people are typing. I was um, struck by the contrast. I mean, we know the hive losses are um, significant, but when you talk about the years, when you were in Wisconsin at 3% losses to 60% losses, it's um, very disheartening. It, 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 it is disheartening, and it, 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 you almost can't believe it. Because, again, you could turn this around. Uh, what if we were buying Australian shekels? And I know that is uh, near and dear to your heart, uh, Denise. Um, and we found out that we were going to purchase this Australian shepherd. However, we found out from the breeder um, that they were suffering a 60% mortality loss um, early in their lives. Or if we were making any widget or product out there that you were sustaining a, a, an average loss of, of above 50%. It, it's just not sustainable. But the good news, again, again, the good news, the takeaway from that is that if you look at the successful beekeepers, the hobbyists, the mentors, find them. There are people who are doing the right things. It's not by luck. If you've been in beekeeping for a number of years, luck can only ride you and take you so far. You can get good bees in a good year and start on new equipment and everything was great. But trust me, soon after that, all the other vagaries of beekeeping arise. Look to mentors in your area. Look for beekeeper, beekeeper survivors in your area. See what they're doing in your area um, that are effective because they're usually using a timing scheme and they're using things that are effective and, and, and work in your area. So, Alex, uh, one participant mentions that uh, their state inspector doesn't like sugar shakes, that they're going to alcohol washes instead, and I know that's kind of a, a growing movement. Can you uh, comment a little bit on that dynamic? Yeah, I certainly can. Um, I, 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 I do both. But here, let me encourage you, here's the short formula for that. I would like to say alcohol washes, but I know you won't use them. You'll go home, and 60% of you will not use them because you're having to dispatch a known sample of bees. Usually it's a 300 set. If you stop and think about it on the colony size, what is uh, as a percentage a 300 loss on a, on a, the reason they like alcohol is because it's almost 100% accurate. You put 300 bees in a, in a, in a wash, you can shake them as hard as you want, you get an accurate count. And the whole key is accuracy. So let's do this instead, okay? I want 100% of you to do sugar shakes so that you can find out what the mite counts are in your colonies. So do this. At the beginning of the year, for your first or second inspection slash sugar shake, do a sugar shake. Then dispatch just that one batch by after you get a sugar shake and you do a mite count, say you got six mites. Then dispatch that group using alcohol, and you get another three mites. What you can then do going into the future is you know what you, you, you are an instrument using a sugar shake in your hand. Calibrate you. So every time you do a future sugar shake, which you will be likely to do because you're not killing your bees, you just take the mite count that you get, and then you add in your slop factor. 
So they're going to be different across the board. Some of you have different sugar shakes. Some of you shake harder. Some of you shake less. The key is you're calibrating your sugar shake instrument to you, and then you're more likely to do more of them in the future, knowing you don't have to keep dispatching 300 bees at a time. And if you have a question, then dispatch another group, say midsummer when the mic counts are, and you're starting to get, I wonder if I'm, I'm still accurate. I wonder if things are still working. You might do that. But I think the real answer here is to use a combination of both of them because one, as a beekeeper, you'll be more likely to do sugar shakes. And two, you can fine tune that sugar shake by adding in a slot factor without having to kill your bees as much. Alex, Joe asks if a bee frame from a strong hive can be inserted into a weak hive and not be rejected by the weak hive bees. Um, and before you jump into that one, folks, if you have to jump off the, the webinar, I understand because of time, if you'll put a thank you in the chat pod there for Alex, I know he'll appreciate it. I really appreciate his time um, this morning. And uh, Alex, strong uh, frame from a strong hive into a weak hive. Yeah, the re and, and one of the reasons this works again is we're back to our stimulus response model. It turns out that even from weakened colonies, if you were to take one of the little tricks to making sure that almost works universally is to take a frame of bees in the middle of the day uh, from a strong colony in the brood nest, which are then primarily covered by brood bees. And it turns out that there are a lot of reasons why the younger, the, the other colony will accept it. If you just dump bees into a box, you're likely to get infighting you, you could even have with enough bees on this frame or frames that you put in, they could even find the queen and potentially see her as an enemy um, and not, um, not, not and, and, and dispatch her. So that if you take start with a single frame and you move it, move it over, um, it's kind of like the bee beard thing. The brood bees are some of the youngest bees in the colony. They're not seen as a threat. Brood bees are identified by age as just doing that. The house cleaners, the enablers, the feeders, um, and so once again, they're seen by the other colony as not a threat. So as we use young bees, we actually use brood bees, not just bees. We don't just shake bees out of a box and make a bee beard out of them. We take brood bees, which are young, unaggressive bees. We tend to get a little more homogeny as we get older. Um, and the same thing for these bees. And if you put them over one frame at a time, you'll find out that these bees, stimulus and response, are going to react not only to the age of these bees, but also to the brood and the food that they're bringing over. This will be an overwhelming um, a force um, that the bees will then respond in kind and go, oh, we've got, we've got mouths to feed, we've got bees to take care of. Things are looking better, things are looking up. Um, so that, that's how you, can, how you can get away with that. Alex, there are a few questions about timing of um, monitoring and varroa applications, calendar time versus phenology. Um, and I wonder if you can speak to that, how to, how to monitor, maybe get away a little bit from the calendar I need to treat in the spring and the fall, your perspective. Yeah, I, I, I really, I, and I, I, I'm actually, I, I wanted to explain, explain the frame uh, that I put up there, and I showed you the B curve, seasonal B curve, and then I showed you this out of phase uh, pest curve that just came to the, the right of that. And that's classic. If you look at all the literature, um, and, and, and generally speaking, you know, 80% of the time, that is what happens. Um, your bees build up, up uh, its, uh, its brood population. Um, the varroa starts laying in those uh, drone and worker cells. The more cells there are to lay in, the more they lay, and things take off, but out of phase. The problem with that, again, is that's a classic way of looking at it. Our bees are coming up from the south again. And so by the time they're laying, even early in the spring, Varroa is already in there. You don't get boxes and packages that say Varroa free. We don't do that anymore. Um, and so they're already ahead of the curve. And so here's what I, I've suggested. I've been in colonies, too many colonies, that even here in southwestern Ohio, in March, the middle of March, the end of March, when I've done sugar shakes and tests, I found high Varroa populations. If you had waited until after the honey is off in July, where the typical curves tell you Varroa is starting to encroach past the threshold level, that colony is going to be long gone. So there's one effective solution for all of this, an overrider, and that is put the calendar away. Do not use the calendar as a general rule of thumb for uh, checking uh, mite loads, pathogen loads. Get in as soon as the weather will permit you. 
whether in your area it's in Feb at the end of February, into March, and do a baseline varroa test. See how your bees came through the winter. Were they able to, uh, if, 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 you, if you overwintered bees. Um, if your packages just came in, again, this is a good reason for not doing an alcohol wash. With those of you who just got a three pound package of bees and they're just getting off the ground, you're gonna go in and you're gonna dispatch 300 of them with an alcohol wash. I don't, I don't think many of you are going to do that. But the key here again is as early as you can, however you got your bees, a swarm, a package, a nuke, a split, a something, get in as early in the year as you can to get that first baseline test. Once you have that number in hand, if it's below the threshold, which it generally should be, uh, take a deep sigh of breath and don't worry about it anymore. If it's high, do something about it immediately. And with cool weather in the spring and smaller groups of bees, you can do an oxalic acid dribble. You can do a lots of things. Then I recommend, again, once you take your baseline, go in in about another three weeks and take another monitoring uh, test. And now for the first time, you're going to get a trend line. What happened for your baseline? What happened with your trend? Already, are, you, are your bees handling what Varroa is or isn't there? Are they coping with it? Are they not coping with it? Or are they really not coping with it? And at that point, that's going to start setting the stage for the rest of the season, whether need, you need to treat and or monitor more often based on what those two treatments told you. Early and then a semi-early treatment. Establish a line that I get you know, six uh, mites on my first and I got uh, 12 on my second, well, obviously things are going in the wrong direction. And you're getting close to 10 mites on 300 is 3%. You're at a roughly a, a threshold level of treatment there. You might seriously want to consider treating at that point. But, but again, don't just calendar it. And don't just specifically don't wait, particularly where your bees came from. They could be further ahead than you think they are. And in the season, just don't assume anything because... Varroa just has a way of, 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 again, geometric growth. They can just get away from us. Don't assume. So, uh, as I said, I've been in many colonies in, in February and March in here that have overwintered that already have. It, they're, they're rare, but they're there. Um, maybe 20, 30 percent already have a significant Varroa uh, population. So don't assume anything, um, and uh, you'll be further off ahead.